Hi, Pearl Jam community. This is Chrissy Ferguson, and I'm here today with Josh Klinghoffer. Josh really needs no introduction. As many of you know, he has been a member of a myriad of bands from an early age, including the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Most recently, Josh has opened for Pearl Jam with his solo project, Plural One, and he has also joined Pearl Jam as a touring member of the band. So welcome, Josh, and thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So we're going to start at the beginning um, of your career, or more so when you first started picking up instruments. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, we talked about that you played drums, keyboard, guitar, and you were mentioning earlier in our conversations um, off screen that you were also playing something else with the band? Yeah, I am. Um... I have, well, I usually say that I play just the, the rock instruments, the rock and roll instruments. Um, anything beyond that is a little too, too complicated for me. But um, I have a, a, a chromatic kalimba over on my right on, on my Pearl, in my Pearl Jam rig um, for the song River Cross. So that's, that's one, another one I guess you can add to my list. But uh, yeah, nothing too fancy for me. Just the rock, the guitar and the bass and the drums and the well, keys. That's a lot of instruments that many of us can't play. So it's pretty amazing. So when you were younger, you first started playing the drums and took some drum lessons. So tell us about that and then how you got involved in, uh, or how you picked up other instruments down the road. Um, the story I always tell is that my mother uh, signed me up for drum lessons sort of before I felt like I had made the, the, the decision on whether I wanted drums or guitar. Uh, lessons and um, she must have thought that I had settled on drums but I remember walking around the the shop being uh, sort of indecisive and um, next thing you knew I had a drum lesson on a certain day and that was it and um, I became a drummer and then I just sort of wanted to start um, exploring what it was like to write songs I'd say in, the, in my mid early mid-teens so I started messing around with the guitar and I sort of learned that I I picked it up kind of quickly um, just by figuring out records and, you know, using my ear. Um, yeah. So before I knew it, I was a guitar player. I, I didn't really set out to be one. It just sort of happened. And then, yeah, I guess um, I'd, I'd stopped playing the drums uh, for a while. Um, but I, I always consider myself a drummer on some level because I, I found that when I would re revisit the drums after putting them aside for a bit and, and becoming more of a guitar player, I, I I liked how I thought about drumming more. There was something freeing about and and more. Um, I, I just I enjoyed my approach to drumming when I stopped once I stopped playing them. If that makes sense, just like thinking yeah. about playing with other drummers as another musician in a band, I, I became the drummer that I liked more. Yeah. So that when I was a kid and I was just. Right. Moving my hands. <laughs> right. And get out some aggression, I'm sure. Right. And this, this, especially in those teen years. When <laughs> we're all Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, w I would, anytime there was a, you know, or I, I remember going, getting in fights with my parents and then just running straight to the drums and basically trying to tell, you know, communicate to them what I, what I was, how I was thinking of them. Symbol right. like hits and stuff. Yeah, I was terrible, but I, I remember doing that a few times. Now, your voice, you have an incredible vocal range. Did you have any vocal training or did you just learn how? Well, uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't even say I had vocal training, but I did. I started meeting with a teacher, an amazing teacher who, um, who sadly died this year um, earlier this year um and he he was he you know i i i regret now especially since he's gone not going a little deeper with it he he basically gave me warm-up tapes and um it was all about how to you know sort of <clears throat> maximize your ability when singing but mm -hmm. i didn't learn let's say how to i yeah i guess i i i'm pretty bad at you know remembering some of the physical I'm, I'm just right. not, the, I'm not, I'm not good at knowing how to control my physicality. If someone says sing from your diaphragm, I, I, right. I kind of go, 
I think I'm doing, I don't know. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I'm not the best at sort of activating that muscle if you tell me to. So, you know, I feel like I had loads more to study when it came to um, singing. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to sing on the higher side and I always, I always think that that came from my early love of the Beach Boys. And, and I, I've been listening to them a bit lately and, um, I, I, I just, I remember so clearly being a kid and singing along with their songs and just kind of feeling like that's how, that's how you're supposed to sing. Because right. when you're five years old, six, seven, that's what your voice does. Right. <laughs> you, you sing in that register. So I, it never, it never, you know, it was only when I started to grow up and, and, you know, listening to music where there was very, a, a low voice where I felt like that doesn't necessarily that's not how I sing, but yeah. Right. It's pretty amazing though. Not many people can reach the notes that you reach. So, well, thank but you. I actually, I, 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 um, I, as I get older, cause I'm not, uh, I'm not as young as I think I am. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I feel like I, I feel like my, my ability to, to sustain my higher register is shrinking. Like, you know, if I overuse my voice, mm -hmm. that high kind of falsetto thing that I, use that I use too much probably is the first thing to go. Right. So yeah, I have to be, I have to be careful and I actually should be warming up and maybe using my voice uh, a little more, you know, technically or a little more, a little more wise, wisely. Yeah. Those wisely, warm ups. I remember uh, taking voice lessons years ago and those, those warm ups of uh, doing the octaves and, you know, it's important, right? <laughs> it's important. It's so annoying, though. Like, I, I, I can't stand the sound of myself doing those warm ups. So, I right. mean, I'm not the, I'm not the most. I can get kind of lazy when it comes to practicing or doing a specific regimen, which those very clearly are. You know, it's like thirty minutes, forty minutes, sometimes thirty five. Um, I, it's more just the sound of myself making those noises that I can't imagine. I, I, I well, on the Chili Pepper tour, I. When I used to tour with them, I, I I would get Anthony does them too, so we're both doing it. I I would try and find a, a room as far away from everyone else in the in the building as I could, and I would I would I would sing into a <laughs> I would sing into a towel to try and mute the you know like the, the horrendous sound you know probably I was probably doing myself a, a disservice by not you know breathing properly <laughs> that I was more concerned with how stupid I sounded to the to the people walking by right right <laughs> well so you were um pretty young when you joined your first band Bicycle Thief right at 17 or yeah there uh, yeah I was 17 when I started playing with Bob Forrest um uh, I, who, whom I met through my sort of best friend's sister. She was dating him at the time. And I was just the kid around the corner from her, her family, her brother's house. And um, he had recently uh, gotten sober and he wanted to play music again uh, after his old band, Thelonious Monster, had been sort of dissolved for a bit. Yeah, and I, so I was 17. He was, he was ancient at the time to me at like 37 or, you know, 30, 30, you know, 30, whatever he was, 38. And, um, and yeah, we formed a, a funny, a funny pair. Like we were like kind of like a, an odd, an odd couple of sorts. And we, we made one record. We played together. We toured a lot, uh, with the Chili Peppers opening for them just cause we were friends with them or he was friends with them, but that's kind of when I met all those guys. And so I've, all, I had been in their orbit for quite a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that that like I said earlier, like I, at a certain point when I started playing with him, uh, I I had to say to myself, oh, okay, I guess you're a guitarist now, right? <laughs> I, which I I really didn't consider myself, right? Uh, but and that's how that's of, how that all started. Yeah, you were a part of um, other bands as well. So um, uh, you were with Dot Hacker, right? And War Paint. And yep, Dot Dot Hacker was the band of my of my kind of me and my friends that was fine that okay. was the first band that i really formed outside of maybe you know like a high school junior high school band but uh dot hacker was a band that i put together sort of in the you know maybe two years before joining the chili peppers and right as we were starting to think about making a an album or right right when we were making our first album i got at, or in the middle of it actually i got asked to join the chili peppers so everyone was always kind of taking jobs and doing a tour here and there. So then I, I, I got one as well. It just happened to be quite a big one and with a lot of, uh, 
a lot of touring and a lot of time spoken for. So that Dot Hacker, you know, we stayed uh, together all the while, um, all, all the time I was in Chili Peppers, but it, it you know, it didn't, it wasn't able to function properly. Hard and War Paint, War, War Paint was actually, uh, um, I, I hadn't really played drums in a long time. So I, I played drums with them for a bit. Uh, and I, I didn't know at the time how long that was going to last, but I was thinking it would just be sort of a, like a, kind of tied them over until they found um, someone more permanent that I, that I thought it would be preferable if it was a, a female. Um, Cause I just thought the concept of them being an all girl band was cooler than, than having a guy drummer. So I, uh, I, but I started playing with them throughout that summer, whatever summer that was 2009, which was the same time that, Flea had brought up the idea of joining their band. So once I once I started playing with those guys, I had absolutely no time to play with with Warpaint anymore. So um, luckily, um, right right when that happened, Stella Muscala was ready to join, and yeah. off they went. So a lot of people don't realize how much work it is to be a musician. They just think, oh, this is this glamorous life, and um, how much would I love to do this, right? And so I'm just wondering, are there is there anything in particularly particular that you could share with people um, that's been difficult? Um, and how did you persevere persevere during those times? You know, there are a lot of young kids who who want to make this per, their profession, and it's hard. It's hard work. So, did you ever yeah. face any difficult times? I'm sure you did. And absolutely. And I think I'm from a particularly difficult era for this kind of thing because I am a, I think I am the last of the Gen X generation. So when it, when talking about making a career out of doing this, I have I'm steeped in the school of not not really wanting to you know be commercial like or you know these kind of myths that we tell ourselves. They grew I grew up sort of. With, look, admiring and looking at the last what I thought group of bands or group of musicians who kind of did it in an innocent way and because that's the only thing that they knew how to do and it's because their passion led them to do that whereas I think after the after the groups that were the generation before me you know, the Pearl Jams and the, those groups um, it, it's uh, something changed. And I think that there was, we reached a point where commercialism and, you know, the reason that kids get into this can, can there is no myth anymore. You can't separate, you know, if anyone's talking about a career, like I said, like I, I never thought of it as a career. I dropped out of high school and I had to do something and I was passionate about music and I got lucky enough to fall in with a group of older people who were already sort of doing that and they had already made their life music and they had already sort of built um their entire existence around the idea of playing music so i was able to kind of just you know bob forrest being one but then opening for the chili peppers being exposed to these guys who had lived this life that i had always dreamed of living so it's, i was like oh well even though i wasn't a success at it if you will at that time it was something that was possible because of the people i was playing with so um i think i got lucky and that's if i was starting from scratch which i think perhaps is the reason why it took me so long to put something on my own together and why perhaps i spent the whole of my 20s just sort of taking you know uh sort of taking uh refuse in these other bands i hope i use that word right um like touring with established artists already that i knew was going to be fun and i was going to learn from and, and a good time um beck pj harvey gnarles barkley these people that were already established and i was able to sort of live my dream and play in bands even though they weren't my band and i wasn't being the creative you know i wasn't putting my creative neck on the line um yeah so that i guess um that that's what I think is particularly difficult about me. I mean, maybe, maybe not other people, but my generation, I feel like it's hard to make a career out of this. If you're trying to do something interesting and especially as we move forward into the future, so much of it has been done before. There'll never be, um, that we'll we'll always need good songs right and good good songs are always welcome and if you can write a great song then 
you're happening. But it's also, you know, how many of the same type of approaches can there be as time goes on? I mean, so many, so many things have been done. So I think it's harder and harder and harder to find, um, to carve out your own yeah. particular sound. Yeah. And you're right. like a combination of influences that, that make your own thing. So, and I think I was just always a little scared and nervous to, to put myself out there. Cause I just all, I felt like there was so much of it already. So, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I often used to regret how long it took me to get around to doing my own thing or write or, or like finally writing songs, finishing them. Cause I can be quite a procrastinator. <laughs> which is which is what that says yeah but um i uh you know w once it became you know just uh once it became just absolutely impossible not to you know write songs and put a band together or you know make these plural one albums then it happened so i guess things happen when when they happen you can't right. you can't ever regret how long it took but yeah i mean just long-winded of course but to answer your question i mean yeah i don't know i mean making a career out of music is a very scary thing and i i happened to get lucky and i fell in with some amazing people but i wouldn't put people off, i wouldn't i wouldn't put people off from playing music and and uh trying to build a life around it but the word career is scary so i wouldn't think i would think if you're a young person and you're interested in songwriting or playing music i would say you really have to make that your your passion and your focus the writing the playing the learning the growing you can't think for a second about the money making and the, the publishing deals and the this and the that because then i just feel like not to say you'll fail, but you're, you're definitely taking a circuitous route to somewhere that I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not even sure where that is, but I mean, right. I, I don't, you know, I don't know. Like I, I certainly don't, you know, it has to be your I passion. Yeah. If I didn't join the chili peppers, I'd be, you know, I'd be, I'd be in a completely different place. Like I, you know, right. that was a, that was the, the biggest, you know, the kind of the most amazing bit of luck that one could ever, have you know just having known those guys and being in the right place at the right time and being the kind of person that they felt they could trust with that job or right. that you know that filling the hole that was left by john's absence at the time right so the next opportunity after chili peppers was working or not working but playing with um ed and um and then you made your debut in ohana didn't you with the band and with the earthlings and um, yeah i had a busy couple weeks there yeah so yeah, we, had, um, we saw you um we saw you there and first we're like who is that <laughs> it's pretty awesome so how did i know it's a kind of a, a long story and that like you said when you were the chili peppers you already started to get to know the band members of Pearl Jam and you knew Mike, you were doing some side gigs with him. And, um, but how did the opportunity to record Earthlings and uh, to play with the, with, to play with Pearl Jam come about? Um, well, I'd say there are two, those are two slightly different stories, but I mean, the, the Pearl Jam thing and just kind of, again, it was just incredibly fortuitous timing to, to leave the Chili Peppers right at the at the time where Pearl Jam was finishing up the Gigaton record and about to embark on, you know, at the time before the pandemic, a, a long tour in support of this new album, their first in a while. Um, they, uh, from what I remember in the, or my early conversation with, with Ed, it was like they, they had discussed kind of maybe needing a little extra help for some of the sounds, but more particularly the background vocals that Ed had done on this record. There was just kind of more of them maybe than there had been on previous records. And um, just because of the way the record was made, I mean, it was just like there was, yeah, there was just things that were, that were sort of essential to some of these songs that... Um, that they, they were considering needing another person. But, you know, obviously Pearl Jam's a tight family and, you know, the idea of just letting some stranger in wasn't too appealing to them. And it, then, you know, I, I was sort of available and I had sort of, I had known, you know, I'd, I'd had a couple of experiences with all the guys individually here and there um, recently, uh, particularly with, with Ed at um, the, my last ever performance with the chili peppers was was at um 
the, the the fundraiser for Flea's Music School in Silver Lake, and Ed played for that. And uh, yeah, so and we had a great hang that night, and we played a couple songs together. And so yeah, I mean, it was a month after that I left the band. So it was just kind of you know in the middle of all these conversations the band was having about needing maybe another another set of hands. Uh, I was available, so that's yeah. how that worked. And um, and then because of that, and then because I had been up in Seattle and just getting to know people more and more, um, you know, now the pandemic has happened, the tour is canceled. But, you know, I'd say in 2021, um, Ed asked me if I would join him at the Vax Live performance. Mm -hmm. And I, that was May of 2021. I had spent the whole first half of 2021 recording quite a bit with um, a guy here in LA called Andrew Watt, who, mm -hmm. um, who has had this sort of meteoric rise to, um, to the prominence in, as a producer. I, mean, I knew him originally as just a, a guy I met through Chad Smith, because um, they'd done a lot of work together. And I had started to put it together that him and Chad had this beautiful musical connection. Chad was over at his house all the time making records. And Andrew was, just has this incredible studio and this incredible work ethic, and it's just busy, busy, busy. So and chad is his his guy and they they're like a production team almost and um chad plays on everything he does almost almost and it's uh, a variety of things so um out of the blue uh at the beginning of 2021 chad andrew and i made a morrissey album together out of the blue and then you know that that kind of roll spun into another project and then all these other things so and i think uh Andrew and, and Ed are in communication. So that there's like this kind of triangular, circular network of people talking. And then when Ed was in town to do the Vax Live performance with me, uh, question, the, the question was, you know, like, uh, proposed, like, how, how, what's it like over at that guy Andrew's house at the studio? You got, you know, I hear it's great. And yeah, so Ed came by and he wanted to see what it was like over there. And, um, you know, within five minutes of him arriving, we were we were writing. We we wrote the halves together, and you know, after hanging out for two three days, we had you know the beginnings of an album. So that was sort sort of like, well, why don't we just kind of keep going? And and so that's how that happened. So you know, I I, had, I wound up doing all the um all, all of this playing with Ed you know, in the time that I normally would have been touring with Pearl Jam. So by the time the Pearl Jam tour be actually began, right. um, we, we had had this experience together. So yeah, they kind of, it's just been kind of like this. And yeah. like, again, I, I, it was pure luck and timing. Um, power of right is the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> I was trying to imagine Eddie screaming it. Power right. Yeah. So that's power <laughs> right. um, and, uh, yes. um, so you, yeah, yeah. You're timing. mostly uh, playing timing. Yes. Right place, right time. Um, so awesome. So uh, with this, we are going to talk a little bit about the Oakland shows and um, the unfortunate, you know, um, it was unfortunate that Matt had tested positive for COVID um, for the shows in May and um, Oakland and Fresno and while many of us might think, okay, well, they're going to just cancel, um, they came together and thought they're going to put kind of a drum team together to kind of to sit in for Matt at the drum kit. And so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what that experience was like, because I know that you mostly were playing guitar uh, with the band up to that point, um, yet you were taking your first lessons were drumming. So <laughs> you're probably a little bit excited about getting to drum, but just tell, tell us a little bit about like how, how that all came to be. Were you very willing to do this? Did you get to pick the songs? Did they tell you what songs you were going to play? Um, whatever you're willing to share, we'd love to hear. Um, I, I, was, I thought I had a pair of drumsticks around because that would help illustrate what it was like, but I don't. Um, the uh, we had we played Phoenix, then we had a day off, and we were um, so no one had seen each you know no one had seen Matt for a day. So then the following day, when we were about to fly to Oakland, he tested positive, and um, 
it had been joked about all through rehearsal and, and, and uh, you know, in the previous weeks that if anyone went down, you know, Matt, Jeff, or either of the guitar players, I would step in. And it was sort of like, oh, you know, at least we have, you know, we have a backup plan or something. And, uh, but I don't know if, how serious that was. But the minute Matt tested positive, I sort of, I thought, okay, it's, I'm up. I can't believe that. It's, I can't. Because I knew that if, if possible, they really didn't want to cancel shows after not um, being able to perform for two years. You know, it just if if there was any way to make it through the show, you know, maybe even no drums and doing acoustic. That the idea was, how can we do that? Right. So um, I happen to I had travel with drumsticks just to do exercises if I if I want the room. So I'm holding my drumsticks, thinking, um, "Wow, it's uh, this might happen." Um, we leave for the airport. A couple other, a couple other suggestions had been thrown out, and I'm sitting there with my drumsticks. Now we're going to the airport. We're getting on the plane, and no one is seriously looking my way. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm starting to feel like, hmm, I thought we were, you know. And obviously, like, I, I still wasn't. I, I wasn't 100 percent sure if we were going ahead, you know, with it, but. Once we were on the plane and we were kind of on our way to Oakland, um, Jeff threw the idea of calling Richard Stuverud out because he co coincidentally lives in Oakland. And those two have a long musical history and have done many projects together. And, um, and I'm sitting there with my drumsticks. Finally, I, I kind of, I think I kind of was like, <clears throat> <you know? laughs> and I, and and Ed finally said, you know, well, we, we've been joking about it. I mean, I guess that I, I realized that no one had really heard me play before. They knew I could play or I had played in the past, but no one had ever really heard me. So I know Stone and, and you know, maybe even Mike um, had never seen me play, you know, may, you know, um, maybe one, for five minutes one time or less. But um, anyway, so. Um, yeah, we, we, we made the decision to split the drumming duties between Richard and myself, uh, mostly because um, I remember there was kind of a question whether either of us were in good enough shape to do a two, two and a half hour show, sit at, like out of the blue. Like, I certainly didn't know if I could. I mean, I remember playing Rockin' in a Free World on Chad Smith's drum set in Seattle with Ed. And at the end, I was like, ugh. Oh, my arms were going to fall off. But yeah. that always happens to me when I play Chad's drums because the three inches that he has on me in height, they somehow translate to this extra like wingspan that I don't have. And I, yeah. and I, it's always exhausts me, but, um, and I play generally kind of, uh, smaller drum setup. Anyway. So I, I was sort of like, well, maybe it is wise to split the drumming duties up, but, um, Ed's, sketched out a, a, a rough set list. He had me go through the master list of songs and kind of write down what I thought I'd be able to do. And yeah, and then we, we landed in and uh, went to the hotel in San Francisco and then quickly went across the bay to the venue um, without Ed. And we just, you know, Richard and myself, and we rehearsed and we, we, we kind of, we, we felt like we could do it after that rehearsal. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that was it. I mean, and, yeah. and then we, we, we felt like we could take care of it. I mean, obviously everyone was so, so sad that this had to be happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, but we were kind of, uh, it carried out, like it was one of those sort of sports, like someone like Matt Cameron is like the, you know, the, the backbone of a team. Right. And, you know, it's like you, you, it's like that star player gets injured Right. And we have to, we have to, we have to win this championship anyway for, for, for the him. people, yeah. you know, yeah, for him <laughs> yeah. and for the, and for the, and for the people, I, uh, you know, the, the, the people that have been dying to see this band for two years. So we, we, we made it through that first night and it did feel in a way like we had won some sort of championship. We, we, we really felt like, you know, against all odds, we pulled it off yeah. and, and the drumming, the, the drumming duties were split up. And some of the songs that Richard rehearsed the night before, uh, suddenly I was doing on the set list. It, it was kind of, I, yeah. I wasn't a hundred percent sure what, what thought process went into delineating who played what song. But um, what I did come to learn through this experience was that I know those first five albums, when I was, the, the albums that came out as a kid, I know those like, the, like the back of my hand, mm -hmm. like the, 
they're in my DNA. So, I mean, I didn't really, Richard was a little less familiar with some of the songs than I was. Um, and he had the, the, he had to do some of the newer songs, which have just been around less time, like, you know, even flow and, you know, those kind of, everyone's heard those for 30 years, but, you know, Richard had to play some of the newer songs. So that took a little bit more, you know, focus for him to look, listen a lot. And there was just not that much time to do so. Um, but I, uh, I found that, um, so I, I found that I didn't have to even rehearse as much. Richard was sort of on the practice kit. We were running the songs with him. I, I felt like I, all I had to do was kind of check um, some of the newer versions, the way they play with Matt to make sure that there's nothing that they do now that's against what they are different to what they do on the record. And, and I was okay. Uh, and a couple like, I even, I remember vividly in, fresno um because we Ed, eddie was really sick that this is the third show after oakland eddie was really sick that day so we we played purple rain and i sang it but we practiced we were practicing that backstage for a long time so when we went on stage i kind of didn't have enough time to really center myself for the drumming for pearl jam and i kind of i had this weird crisis of confidence about where the drums come in in elderly woman which is i think what we played first <laughs> and You'll hear it. If you listen to the live recording, I hit a crash cymbal when the drums come in on the album. Because the way the band plays it live now, they come in later. But I was suddenly like, uh, I couldn't, I, I, did, I just didn't have time to review that. And then my muscle memory from years of knowing that song crashed where they came in on the record. And the minute I hit the crash... I, I, re I remember that they don't come in now until after the first chorus. So I'm was, sure no one noticed. <laughs> well, they probably noticed the crash because um, it was a, it was it was like just a crash out of the blue, nothing, just one hit. Oh, okay. But but I, I I so I felt terrible about it for the next until I went back. I listened to the record and I was like, yeah, see, I mean, I can't help that, you know. I that's in my DNA where those drums come in because the drums come in differently than the way they play them now. So right. I just thought it was kind of funny. And if you, now that you know this, if anyone goes back and listens, you'll, you'll know that that right was here. my, it was almost, it was honestly, it was like my mind and my childhood sort of like musical sense, muscle memory right. acting against my, you know, better, better wishes. Like, right. I, I don't know. Ah! <laughs> So had you talked to Matt and I, I'm assuming it sounds like when, after I talked to Rich that he really gave you all his blessing and, you know, sit, sitting in for him. Um, did you get to talk to him and, and, you know, talk about sitting in at the drum kit? I, we didn't talk so much about doing it and we actually haven't spoken about it much since, but while he was sick, I mean, obviously, um, I was just checking in with him a lot. Like, I just felt like, you know, especially since I was going to be, you know, I, I, I didn't, I don't want to ask him for any pointers or right. tips or anything, but I, I was just really checking in. I really wanted to maintain as much of a connection with him as I could. I mean, I, I know what it's like to have that happen to me because it happened to me on the Ed, Eddie solo tour in February and I got left behind in Chicago. So I, I know for him exactly how it feels to have your band, you know, carry on without you. And um, so I just really wanted to um, establish as much of a, you know, I, I felt like, you know, he's sick. He's, he's in a hotel room sick. I didn't want to pester him too much, but I felt like I was on the verge of texting him too much. Like, Hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? But like, I really just wanted him to know that he was, he was on my mind, you know, every second of that experience, you know, like I, you know, obviously, like it was a thrill for me to play the drums with that band and, and you know, and, and just really help the, the team as much as I could um, in any way that I could. And I was so, uh, you know, I was so almost grateful that I was in a position and I knew how to play those songs and the drums enough to help them make it through right. uh, another, another couple shows, you know, um, it seemed but like yeah, I mean, as far as ta talking to Matt, like I, I was just texting him constantly. Yeah. And it seemed like there was a pretty good vibe from the recording um, and from the YouTube videos I watched as far as um, how the uh, audience received you all. And they were seemed like they were excited that you all were there. I mean, obviously they were missing Matt and everybody was bummed about that. But then when they saw you all come in and then especially Kai coming in, 
uh, for one of the shows um, playing Mind Your Manners. And, uh, and then we had um, Josh Arroyo come in for one of the shows playing Yellow Lead Better at the end. It's kind of like everybody came together. And that's what I love so much about music and concerts is it's like we can leave all of our divide behind and kind of come together and cheer each other on. And I felt like that those, especially those Oakland shows with, with Kai and Josh getting to step in and then you and Rich and then Dave later in Fresno, that it was like, it was such a community um, building experience. And it may not have been Matt Cameron, you know, but it was a pretty awesome experience, I think for the audience. Yeah, and I think the bar that Matt Cameron sets is so high and everyone knows. I mean, I think his middle name is fucking, right? Like Matt fucking <laughs> yeah. Cameron. I mean, I mean, everyone knows that he is, you know, beyond genius and and just um, such an inspiration uh, as a musician, full stop. Not even, you know, more so than just drumming, Every other, everything he plays, which is everything, I think. And, um, you know, I think because of how amazing Pearl Jam because of how amazing the fan base is and how amazing Pearl Jam has been at cultivating this relationship with the fan base, I think, you know, I don't know if every band could step in to a, a st an arena with a, a fill-in drummer, you know, taking the place of an iconic musician who's not only been in Pearl Jam for 20 years or so, over 20 years, but, you know, he's also been in other, you know, another band that, that everyone in that room is probably a fan of. And just, you know, uh, Eddie had the amazing, you know, stroke of genius idea to start this first show basically like backwards, you know, and we came out with the house lights on and played Rockin' in a Free World. And I had, you know, that, that Chad Smith always talked about it. Like the, the view he has, you know, uh, is, is phenomenal. And when I, when you have that kind of panoramic view of the entire crowd looking at you um, and the smiles on their faces, and especially with the house lights on, which is a rare, you know, how, how many bands have the house lights on when they're playing? And so we came out first song of the night played Rockin' and Free World. I've seen many Pearl Jam shows and I know the level of elation that's in the room when you've gotten to that end, the finish line of a show. And it looked like we had been playing for three hours already with the, the smiling and the, and the joy that, that was, in the room and we had only been on stage for you know a couple of seconds and then so we played yeah. that song i think we played a second song maybe with the lights on and then and then ed sort of briefed the room on what we were dealing with and yeah. you know just uh, um like i said the, the the band the pearl jam fans and i know this because i'm one of them uh i, I just think there's a level of love and understanding and support that the fans have for the band that that again it's cyclical and i and and i also for me on a personal level like uh, obviously matt going down with this obnoxious virus is is a tragedy but in a way especially after the the, the experience we've all globally had with this virus just kind of the 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 fact that like we've all had to do we just you have to kind of make it happen and you know, the, hopefully the fans of the Bay Area will see Matt Cameron play drums soon enough. Um, and, you know, just showing the world that, hey, you know, we're going to get it done with what we have. And and, and there's still going to be the same amount of love and joy there. You know, uh, the, the, the drum fills might not be as, as great. <laughs> and... Um, and uh, and we're going to get it done with a guy in the crowd and we're going to get it done with a 14 year old kid. And, you know, it, like it's just it's breaking the kind of barrier between the fan, like the, the audience and the band. And we're all kind of in this together. Like and I think Pearl Jam is an, an amazing, if not the best example of a band who really the band and the crew, like everyone who's working together to put on that show and make this music come to life is uh it's it really is a team effort and you know and it's kind of often forgotten but the audience is kind of the most uh important part of the team i mean i think seattle is kind of famous for having the 12th man flag right for their football team mm -hmm. i mean that's what it felt like it felt like the 12th man was was really you know propelling those shows right and that crew the crew too i mean the crew members lighting sound i mean 
it just, they're all such amazing people, at least the people I've spoken with and I've met. Um, they're also a huge part of the Pearl Jam team that really makes everything tick. Um, and all the techs. And oh, everything. yeah. Yeah. No, they're, they're, I mean, most of them have been there for decades, you know, right. and they, they've, um, you know, I, 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 the Chili Peppers had a wonderful crew as well. And, you know, I, I've had a great, um, I've been very lucky to, to be on these big tours where I'm sure there's lots of examples of kind of impersonal relationships between the performer and the crew because they're just interchangeable sometimes. And there's, you know, maybe certain artists who just kind of come in and leave and, you know, but I, I've always been the kind of person, especially when it was, when I was in the Chili Peppers and I had, I had say over, you know, like, you know, I could say when I want to be there, but I, I just love going in early. I love being in the venue. I love kind of soaking up the environment that I'm about to play in. And, you know, and I love hanging with the, the, the people that have been there and in my mind working a lot harder than I am. I mean, like you said earlier, it is hard work and it's a job, but for me, I mean, I'm still lucky enough to kind of consider what I do nothing but fun. I mean, I finally, when I joined the Chili Peppers, I finally became a little more serious about it because it was quite literally, if I didn't do my job, then lots of other people weren't going to have a job. If I, you know, didn't show up or wasn't, you know, then all the hard work that the people that are working all day, then it, you know, so it, it, it did, you can't, it's hard to not think of it like that when there is so much riding on your job, your performance or whatever. Right. But um, I still really do have the luxury um, of, of doing this cause I love it, you know? And um, yeah. And I, again, I, I get, I get lucky. I get luckier and luckier with, with just the timing and the, and, and the people that I know and the people that, that, um, that I've had the, the good fortune of, of coming in contact with. Well, and you're extremely talented, so that helps too. So let's go into your, so, so they think, <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your solo project. Not gonna argue one. With them. Um, <laughs> um, I know that you have three albums out, correct? Yes. Okay. And the most recent one, it um, came out in May, I believe. This is a show. Uh, or was it May? It came out. It came out in March. March. But, okay. I mean, the, the I think the CD came out in May, and the vinyl is still not out yet. Okay. So, I'm not sure. You know, we're in a we're in like a global uh, vinyl backlog. I actually just got my Earthling vinyl yesterday. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> two days ago. Two days ago. Yeah. So I mean, that album came out in February. Yeah. Or, or yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Back to your um, projects, <laughs> your solo projects. So how is that going? Um, how, and how did you decide to kind of go off on your own and do this solo project? Um, I, well, I had never uh, set out to be a solo performer or a solo or play live so by myself or be a solo artist. I, I always wanted a band. I mean, uh, the Dot Hacker Band was the band that I finally put together with some friends that I felt like I had trust in and we could do this together. And then, as I said, the Chili Peppers took a lot of my uh, time and focus for the, uh, for a while. But um, that's what I had always wanted was a band. Um, after being in a band with those guys for you know the duration of my time in the Chili Peppers, it was just clear that it wasn't feasible to do both and have it be this mutual collaborative band experience. So once Don Hacker had made three albums, basically anytime the Chili Peppers had a break in the action, I was ready to make an album. And in for the past, you know, 10 years or so, it had been with Don Hacker. But after the experience of making that third Don Hacker album, it was clear to me that no, like, usually it was me that was calling those guys and saying, hey, let's do something. I got time. No one was picking up the phone. So I finally got the message that if I want to do an album, I'll just do it myself. I don't, I'm not going to include people that aren't as excited as I am about doing it. So, so I made the first plural one album, um, back, uh, in 2019. Uh, actually, I guess it was 2018 and then 2019. So finished it over two kind of big swaths of time, but I was still very much in the chili pepper. So it was sort of a, 
um, a side thing, you know, and I was just making record, I was recordings to, to make recordings. I didn't intend for it to be this solo project. Uh, and then another, the timing was so funny. I mean, it came out three weeks before I wound up leaving that band and the name came from, it was an old name that I'd thought of when we were trying to name dot hacker. So I it hit me at a certain point, like, Oh gosh, I'm going to need a name for this. So I just, I chose not to, think too hard about it and i just picked an old one that i still like the concept of um and uh yeah and then you know as far as uh i was gonna go open for pearl jam with having uh, only having the one album out so as far as the getting to now uh, having three i mean we have the pandemic to thank for mm -hmm. that and i you know like a pandemic was a tragedy on a on a a massive scale but for me who finally had a little bit of time to kind of take a break from touring and and take a break from basically everything i i just went straight to work with which is what i tend to do all the time and uh and made another album so then i then i had two albums out in the course of a year and then after right after i put that second one out the dot hacker guys were we were still kind of all communicating like this on zoom or something and we got the idea to maybe try another thing together remotely and we we we, did, we got one song done and then similar things just kind of came out of that collaboration um that that i thought wouldn't be um a problem anymore and uh it wound up just being too difficult to do it as a band. So myself and Clint Walsh, who was one of the guys in Dot Hacker, we were finding that it was fun to collaborate again. And um, I basically had gotten so excited about the idea of doing a record with them that I had written 10 songs really fast, or there are, you know, 10 or 12. And um, I basically just threw them to him and he produced them. And that, that was kind of the workflow that we had decided would be the best at that time. Because of again, we were still sort of isolating and not, being in the same room and uh clint had become a producer in the in the in the time since i had worked with him last uh he had made a record on his own um a couple of things and uh he had learned how to sort of engineer and work the computer and do all these things and and i was i was really impressed with his ability and his dedication and yeah and he and i made made a record together and it was very convenient for me because while he was working on these songs i was able to be freed to go make a solo record with with Eddie, right? <laughs> awesome. So it was almost like being able to do two things at once, which is what I, I was is all I want to do in life was be able to do right. it as much as I can. Right. Yeah. So so thanks to Clint Walsh, I was able to kind of make that happen. And will you continue to open up for uh, Pearl Jam with some of your songs? Yeah, I'm I'm doing it again on this next North American leg. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So your last question for you, I know we've been talking quite a while. I'm sorry about that, but no, it's my um, fault. I I'm long winded. <laughs> no. Um, in your career, you've done again, going back to the career word, but you've done so, so much in your musical career. Um, you've even been inducted into the hall of fame. Um, if you could pinpoint one or two moments in all that you have done, what are you most proud of? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's that term recency bias um, and, and because we were just talking about it and this was sort of the umbrella with which this uh, interview came from. I mean, playing drums for Pearl Jam and again, not 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 because um, all, all, m more because I was prepared enough through years of listening to music at a time when I wasn't any stretch of professional and it's just doing it as a child because mm -hmm. I was so connected to these songs being able to take that love of music 30 years later and be there for these guys like you know whatever it was show show my love back to them by being able to play these songs in a way that made them comfortable to do it in in front of an arena full of people on multiple occasions that that's one of the highlights i'd say mm -hmm. um and then you know maybe uh and then obviously you know mac mac cameron was always one of my drumming heroes as a you know so like i i just just being able to sort of text him and and <laughs> tell him that i that i you know i i hope he's feeling okay um mm -hmm. you know 
just I mean, this whole experience with Pearl Jam is one big, you know, m mouth agape sort of I, I can't believe this is happening just because of how important they've always been to me. Uh, and particularly when I was a kid. But um, another highlight I would say would be playing in Egypt with the Chili Peppers. I mean, which was as my my you know, the same year that I ultimately wound up leaving. So it was kind of, you know, after a long time being in that family and making music with those guys, um, you know, just being a part of something that had enough energy behind it to take it halfway around the world and play in front of these structures that have been there for 5,000 years. No one knows how they got there. I mean, yeah. to, so in a way to to really just move the the like kind of play with the fabric of time and space in that way like right. literally going halfway around the world and playing in a space that has been occupied by you know by civil civilized you know human beings yeah. for five, thousands of years um you feel the history uh, around you it's a pretty cool feeling yeah 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 i'd say those those are two that come to mind although i mean the fact that I don't have a nine to five job and I get to play with these amazing people is every day is a highlight for me. So, right. you know, it's hard to pick a couple, but I guess, you know, th those are two that come to mind. Yeah. Those are, you've had quite a career, so I'm sure there are a lot of uh, high points um, throughout. And I just wanted to make sure where can everyone um, download or listen to your plural one albums? Is <sighs> I think on all the streaming services, I mean, I know okay. for sure on Apple and Spotify and, you know, I think that you could buy the records, uh, you know, most places. I mean, I know record stores probably don't carry them, but I'm sure everyone can order them and you can definitely order them all from ORG music, uh, whatever their website is, dot com. I don't know. Or my, the label that puts them out, ORG music, um, very graciously puts my records out and you can get them from them. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, Josh, thank you so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate it. And um, as Josh just said, you can purchase CDs, vinyls to come, I guess, on the more recent album. Yeah, um, soon. Every, any minute now. Very I soon. Know and any other Plural One merch that you might want at orgmusic.com. And um, don't forget to follow the Wishlist Foundation on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on Instagram at at wishlist pj and stay tuned for new content and posts about our pre-party fundraising events before every pj show that's coming up this fall so thanks again josh for your time and i look forward to seeing you on the road yeah thank you thank you for having me this was really fun to talk about it was fun talking to you too